Hello, and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This is a show about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm the Director of Software Engineering at ACI Learning. I'm very excited to welcome a special guest onto the podcast this week. With me today is Vlad, or Vladislav Zavilov. Welcome, Vlad. Thanks for joining me. Hi, I'm very glad to be a part of this uh, podcast. I'm very glad to have you. And we were talking earlier about uh, mispronouncing names. So could you say your own name just so that we got it on the record? Sure. So my name is Vladislav Zavyalov. It's a Russian name, so no worries if you don't get it right. <laughs> I don't worry about it too much myself. All right. Well, thanks again for joining me. And uh, for the listeners that haven't heard of you, how would you describe yourself? Um, so I'm a Haskell developer um, and mostly I'm a self-taught Haskeller. So um, I want to make the, uh, the language easy for others to learn as well. Um, and uh, my interest in dependent types actually started as a way of simplifying the current Haskell practices. So the more I tried to develop uh, software with static guarantees in Haskell, uh, the more I started using extensions such as GADTs, type families, um, and so on, and I got burned bad by them. So it, if, you, if you're not careful with that, um, then you end up writing basically unmaintainable code. Um, and now I've made my mission to uh, change Haskell into a language where you can make uh, where you can write code that is simultaneously maintainable and has good static guarantees. That is a good mission and I'm happy that you're working on it. I've definitely experienced some of that pain you're talking about where as you add more advanced type level features, the program gets simultaneously easier and harder to maintain. So I'm looking forward to some to diving into some of the talk on dependent Haskell. But before we get there, I understand that you work for Serokel, which is a Haskell company, more or less, right? Yeah, exactly. So I represent the research division of Serokel. Uh, we have some commercial clients and we work in the areas of financial technology and uh, other areas where high security and correctness are required. Uh, but myself, uh, I mostly work with my team uh, of uh, four people and we are focusing on GHC exclusively. Um, and maybe sometimes we help with internal products uh, and the blog uh, to write something, uh, something useful for the public to make our work more visible and maybe help others get into this topic, get more familiar with dependent types um, in Haskell. Uh, so yeah, um, basically I, I want to praise my company for giving me this opportunity because it's basically my dream job to be working on GHC uh, and I get to decide uh, which tasks to work on. I, I have basically complete freedom of prioritizing what needs to be done in GHC as long as I can uh, argue why it helps us to get closer to dependent types. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. It's really encouraging to have a private company with so many developers working solely on GHC. I'm merely a consumer. Me and my company are consumers of GHC, so we definitely benefit from your work. So thank you and thank your company. You're both doing great stuff. So you touched on this already, but dependent Haskell is an area that you're interested in. And as you mentioned, I've seen some posts on the company blog about that, both authored by you and an interview with you. So from an extremely high level, could you tell us what are dependent types and more specifically, what is dependent Haskell? All right, so dependent types are a feature of the type system. Um, and for any given language, you could say that it either has them or it doesn't have them. Uh, Haskell is currently in a sort of gray area where it technically doesn't have them, but with enough effort and workarounds, you can get similar expressivity that's called singleton types. Um, and that's current practice with JDTs and type families. So uh, dependently type programming in Haskell is, um, is a topic that, um, well, many people are trying to do it, uh, but one of the way to get into it is to actually start with an actually dependently typed language such as Agda or Coq or Idris, 
and then try to translate those concepts back into Haskell and use the Haskell's awkward encoding of them. Um, so um, that's why basically I want to add dependent types to Haskell to make the encoding instead of it being awkward to make it straightforward. Um, and um, the, the exact description of the feature, what dependent types are, uh, basically bo boils down to two built-in types, uh, sigma types and pi types, or dependent sums and dependent products. Uh, so if we could say that Haskell has those two types, then we say that Haskell has got dependent types. Uh, and the way to understand that uh, the, these two concepts is that um, actually we will also have user-defined dependent types. Um, in the, uh, and the analogy I would use is algebraic data types. So you have either, which represents usual non-dependent sums, and you have tuples, which represent normal non-dependent products, um, and you have functions. And basically when you are defining your own algebraic data type, um, you're just using, you're just doing it for a better API. You could, in theory, just stack tuples on top of either's and on top, and do this like giant nested structure, um, where instead of defining like a data type with five constructors, you use either five times nestedly. Um, yes, and that's the same relation between dependent types um, uh, that will be defi user definable and sigma types and product types. So th those two are the core concepts. If you understand them, you basically get the building blocks for dependent types. Um, but then um, it's up to the users um, to define their own and apply them, apply the type system feature to design better APIs. Now, uh, I will explain uh, first dependent sums because they are easier and then dependent products. So a dependent sum, uh, you can think of it um, as a generalization of normal sums. Um, so if you think you can think about uh, an either value actually as a pair. So as the first component you have the constructor it's either left or right and as the second component you have the value attached to it. It's either uh, the value of one type or the other type and in this sense uh, the first value in this pair determines the type of the second value. Uh, so, if you have, uh, for example, either int bool, uh, then left in the first component means you have an int in the second component, and right in the first component means that you have a bool in the second component. Um, and this, this is basically the dependency. That's how um, the type of one value can depend on another. Uh, and product types um, like this, uh, well, uh, I mean some types, dependent some types are a generalization uh, because instead of just left or right, you can have arbitrary values uh, in the first component. So the direct um, correspondence would be between either and uh, a dependent pair where the first component is bool because you have two values. You would say that false corresponds to left and uh, true corresponds to right. And then if you have false, then it's one type in the second component. If you have true, it's another type in your second component. But uh, it could also be uh, three possible values or four possible values. Um, and as long as you have a finite amount of possible values in the first component, you can actually still model it as a normal al algebraic data types. Um, but if you have an infinite amount of possible constructors, if you have an int in the first component, then that's actually, you, can't, you, can't, you, can, you cannot define uh, an ADT with an infinite amount of constructors. Uh, and then you would actually use a dependent pair. For example, um, you may want to define a vector uh, which is at least parameterized by its length. Uh, and this length is uh, supposedly a compile time parameter, so it's not uh, part of the structure. Uh, and 
then you have then maybe in some part of the code you want to produce a vector that is of unknown length for example the user has entered it from the keyboard um, or you you have read it from some other sort of file or downloaded from network and you are trying to write out this type uh, which is a vector of ints for example of length n but what is n we do not know what is n is at uh, compile time uh, and that's when we would have to use a dependent pair. We would say that, okay, here is a pair. The first component is some n which is known only at runtime. Uh, but then in the second component, we use this n, which is known, which is a value known only at runtime. We actually use it as part of the type. So we say we have a vector of this length, length stored at, in the first component. But uh, even though it's known only at runtime, it's still... Uh, recognized by the type system as some some symbolic value um, and uh, that's basically what dependent types means it means that uh, the compiler in the type system starts reasoning about values which are actually uh, runtime values and you you get this uh, 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 the, the distinction between types and values blurs you basically no longer speak of types and values as two separate worlds in which like your program lives uh, it's no longer two sub languages and instead you start talking about the compile time and runtime phase separation so you still know that you have erasure uh, and you know that these values will be passed around and they will take memory when your program runs and these values are um, only during compile time and only the type system makes use of them, but you also can mix and match those two as, uh, as much as your use case requires. Right. Okay. Well, thanks for that overview of dependent Haskell. I feel like already I understand it better than I did 10 minutes ago. I especially appreciate the analogy you drew between kind of the value level ADTs for either and either's and tuples versus the type level sigma and pi types, which are terms I've heard before, but never really knew what they meant. So I appreciate that. I also like drawing the parallel between the ergonomics of being able to define your custom types versus building complex types out of either's and tuples. And I think most Haskell programmers can probably realize that those two things are isomorphic. You can convert between them without you losing any information, but it would be a big pain to always work with the either's and tuples. Using those custom types is very nice. You also mentioned a couple of things that I want to dig into a little bit. So one of the things is that you noted Haskell is kind of in this weird middle ground between having dependent types and not having them. So what motivated you or really the larger community to want to add dependent types to Haskell versus trying to make another language that already has them, like let's say Idris, you know, bring all the nice stuff that Haskell has to Idris. So, so why bring dependent types to Haskell rather than the other way around? Yes, yeah, so basically uh, the reason for that is that there is always more than one feature that defines a language. And Idris is not Haskell plus dependent types. Uh, it's a different language. And one of the most notable differences is that it has strict evaluation. Uh, and it has it by design. There is no plans to make it lazy by default, uh, which is a fine design choice, but not the one that I subscribe to. I want to be writing in a lazy language. And in this sense, Haskell is very unique. There are very few other lazy languages. Uh, and the reason for that is the difficulty of implementation. Basically, our hardware is not meant to execute lazy programs. And there has been... Uh, a very large amount of engineering effort and insight into developing STG, the intermediate representation, the virtual machine uh, with lazy evaluation semantics, and the backend that translates it into machine code, and then the runtime system which supports all of that. And it's basically, in my view, a miracle that Haskell runs as fast as it does. Uh, and it's the, and it's got lazy evaluation which has all the nice, nice all the nice denotational properties so when I'm writing code I often make use of them um, and if 
I wanted to have a language that has uh, dependent types and lazy evaluation. Haskell is basically the most practical starting point to get there. Uh, another one would be to work on the performance of Agda and make because Agda is also a lazy language by virtue of compiling to Haskell. Uh, and that I think is also um, a very nice thing to have. Uh, but I'm starting from Haskell because I'm more comfortable with Haskell and I have a stronger emotional attachment to it. I've been writing it for so long. I just wanted to get better. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I can definitely appreciate that Idris is a completely different language and, you know, compiling down to Haskell maybe isn't the same as having it uh, part of GHC in the first place. That does make me wonder about uh, related kind of advanced type level efforts that have been landing in GHC recently, most notably linear types. Um, does dependent Haskell play nicely with linear types or are they completely orthogonal things? Do they not care about each other at all? How do they fit together? Oh, they care about each other very much. And it's uh, a very difficult research topic of how to combine them. And basically there has been a fresh paper by Richard Eisenberg about using uh, a formalism which unites uh, dependent types with linear types uh, as a property of quantifiers that introduce variables. But uh, as far as I understand it, it currently doesn't handle multiplicity polymorphism. Um, it's closer to what Idris 2 has. So in Idris 2, um, the second version of Idris, uh, they've also combined linear types and dependent types. And every time you write a function, you annotate the uh, in the type whether you can use this function parameter zero times one time or as many as you want uh, and zero times corresponds to haskell's for all which means it's erased it has parametricity properties that we care about um, and nice performance properties uh, as many as you want is basically dependent types it's a normal um, function value which you can duplicate uh, or ignore um, and since it's Idris you can also use it in the rest of the type signature that's pi types which I've just realized I'm yet to explain I only explain uh, sigma types but uh, anyway uh, and then there is the uh, one multiplicity annotation which means that you've got to use it exactly once and that's linear types uh, and in Haskell, we are looking towards something very similar. So we are going to have annotations on the variables introduced uh, by a function. But we've also got to worry about multiplicity polymorphism, which says that we actually don't know if this is a linear or a nonlinear value. Uh, for example, if we are writing the map function for lists, uh, we would like to say um, in linear types that if the function provided by the user that we are applying to each list element is linear, then the entire mapping of the list is also linear. Uh, so if f is linear, then map f is also linear. But if f is not linear, then map f is not linear. Um, and in this sense, uh, like the annotation on one function arrow determines the annotation on another and that's where you get a multiplicity variable that's part of linear types uh, and the current theory uh, ha doesn't actually combine those sort of linearity variables with uh, dependent Haskell in a nice way so uh, we have like a design in which linear types and dependent types are sort of separate entirely separate features so if you have like a dependent quantifier you cannot use linearity with it um, but so, so, so basically that's the design that was uh, established before linear types were introduced into Haskell and we're roughly following this uh, as our guideline or more of a fallback plan like if if we don't figure out how to combine linear types with dependent types uh, then we still can get both of them they will just not play too nicely but there is like a real opportunity that we will figure it out and that those will actually have an, a very beautiful interplay between each other okay so it sounds like it's still a bit of an open research problem but also sounds like you're hopeful 
And linear types landed in GHC 9.0. Is there an expectation for when dependent Haskell may be available to end users? Um, well, no. Uh, the The problem is that um, with uh, dependent Haskell, there is still some design questions that um, needs to be resolved. And that's happening as part of the GHC proposals process. So while we have like um, a general vision of where we want to get, we don't have the specifics because the specifics that were developed as part of the theory, they were developed in a vacuum. Like that's the dependent Haskell that we want. And then there are a million questions about backwards compatibility uh, because we don't uh, want to suddenly have, for example, one namespace for variables. Uh, if you are defining a function, you can use um, the same name for a type variable and a term level variable, and that will be like entirely non-problematic currently because uh, we have two sub-languages uh, entirely separated, uh, and uh, it doesn't even ma basically there is no in direct interaction between them, uh, and if you have like two things with the same name, well, no problem, GHC always knows which one to use. Um, but if we want types to depend on values, that suddenly means you can reference values in your types. And then it means you can reference uh, variable names in your types. And that means uh, that suddenly you do care about two variables in two namespaces, which are the same thing. Uh, and uh, it's it's a very tough balancing act how to introduce this and to have uh, reasonable error messages, reasonable user experience instead of like unleashing this monster patch that breaks half half of the package, <laughs> uh, and <laughs> yeah, um, basically has terrible error messages. No, we don't want that. Uh, so the current efforts are more focused towards uh, figuring out how to integrate the dependently typed features and the, the features that exist in Haskell today. And then there is also the engineering work required because uh, we will need to modify um, pretty much every bit of the GC front end. So that includes parsing, that includes name resolution, um, and that includes type checking. We will also need to modify the core language to support dependent quantification. And the core language is heavily used by the optimizer. That's like the representation on which it operates. Um, but hopefully we will not have to change to the backend. So STG and everything past that, uh, we will not have to worry about that. It stays the same, but the front end and the internal language, all of it requires some sort of update uh there is already existing work towards that end for example the current internal representation that uh, gc uses is called uh, system fc which means system f with coercions and there are very nice papers about it um, and there are primitives in it which are used to represent uh, type level equalities which are used to decode oh, Basically, this is the abstraction into which current type level features of Haskell are compiled into. So type families are compiled into equalities um, and uh, JDTs are compiled into equalities. Um, data families uh, are also compiled to using coercions and equalities, but this is not expressive enough to represent proper dependent type, dependent sums and products. Uh, and an alternative uh, formalism was developed uh, called system DC, system D with coercions, D for dependent, I suppose. Um, and uh, it's a new system, which is like, it's on, it exists only on paper. Uh, so we will uh, need to rewrite the very like core of GHC, the, the most basic, uh, um, the most central representation of Haskell programs uh, through which the uh, every program basically compiles through core. We will we are changing that uh, to include this new feature, and that means we will need to very carefully update the optimizer as well. Um, 
and like that's tricky engineering work and uh, personally I haven't even started looking into it like I'm just observing it from a distance and focusing on like the parser and the name resolution and more user facing aspects more than internal aspects um, that's like uh, beyond my current uh, capability to ha to tackle these super technical topics although I'm planning to get into it eventually uh, I'm just uh, like focusing on things that I understand right now and which are equally valuable, I think. Yeah, yeah, that engineering work does sound tricky to put it mildly, but I'm glad that you're focusing on the user facing stuff first, because I think hammering out those proposals and figuring out how should this feature even behave is really important before digging into how are we going to implement it into GHC. And I'm actually curious about that proposal process because I know that you're part of the GHC steering committee and that you have authored many GHC proposals yourself. And that's not something that we've discussed on the podcast before. So could you tell the listeners a little about the proposal process and how, you know, what you do as part of the committee? Um, yeah, sure. So the proposal process was, um, conceived as a way of getting more community feedback uh, about Haskell features because previously if you've got someone who is very motivated and wants to get something into Haskell they talk to Simon and they get it into Haskell <laughs> uh, uh, but then it was decided that uh, maybe we are now a mature language which, need, which needs a proper process uh, and representatives from industry, from education, and from research areas to express their views. Do they actually want this feature? Or maybe they want it, but they want it to be different. Uh, and that's uh, how the GC steering committees uh, compiled from uh, people who represent uh, as diverse as possible areas. And then there is also community feedback. So anyone um, who cares about Haskell can comment on any proposal with constructive feedback or even just to support it or say that uh, it, like, it looks very difficult. Please change something about its user experience. Um, every comment is fair game as long as it helps the proposal author to modify this proposal um, and the process is that there is also uh, that there is always a person who m must have enough time and resources to push the proposal forward so they've got this idea and they've got to develop the design for this feature they've got to uh, write a convincing motivation convincing to everyone both the committee and the community uh, they've got to research how this feature will affect the ecosystem. So they've got to describe, will it cause breakage? How much breakage if it does? Do we want a migration strategy? So that's, uh, and, and that's basically the, the sections of the proposal. First, you've got motivation, then the proposed change specification, and then effects and interactions. And you've got to describe all of that. And hopefully if it's convincing, you submit it to the you, you first discuss it with the community the committee is involved later uh you gather feedback you incorporate it into your proposal and when you basically get no comments from the community for two weeks or something uh you decide okay it's time i'm submitting it you ping the secretary uh who relays your proposal to the committee's mailing list which is also open everybody can subscribe to it and see the deliberations. It's it's nothing secret, nothing behind the curtain. Everything is in the open. Um, so you can see what the committee members think about this proposal uh, and their reasoning for either accepting it or sending it back. You don't have to follow the committee's deliberations because in the end you get a report. Basically, we either accept it or we say you first need to change this, that and that. Um, and um, after some back and forth with the author, hopefully we get to some sort of conclusion um, whether this is the future that we want for Haskell or not. And then uh, once it gets accepted to the GC proposals repository, it's waiting for someone to implement it. So maybe if somebody wants to contribute to Haskell and they don't know uh, wh where to start, 
this person could go through the list of accepted but not implemented proposals and think uh, think through if any of those proposals appeals to them and looks implementable maybe they could uh, drop the author of this proposal a message uh, to ask for advice for implementation um, and basically start hacking. I've got like this page gc.dev which helps you set up an environment and uh, uh, start working on GHC. Uh, but I suppose we can discuss it uh, later. Sure. Yeah, thank you for sharing the proposal process and your role and the committee's role in it. I do want to come back to ghc.dev later, but suffice to say, it's a valuable resource for getting started with GHC development. And as you mentioned, if anyone is interested in making a new proposal or implementing a proposal, that website should be able to help you out with that. But you mentioned something earlier that I want to loop back on, which is for dependent types, you had described what a sigma type is, but not what a pi type is. And you said you wanted to tell us what that is. So could you tell us now? All oh, right, exactly. So, uh, the sigma types are dependent sums and they generalize either. And in the same manner, uh, pi types are dependent product types and they generalize tuples. So with a pi type, in order to understand it, first you need to think about tuples as functions uh, and the isomorphism of tuples as functions uh, works as uh, you can think about it as follows. So if you have a tuple of two elements, that's basically a function taking a bool as input. If you if you pass it true, you get you get the first component. If you pass it false, you get the second component. Um, but uh, in current Haskell, you can you can only use this encoding if both components have the same type. Uh, and in dependent Haskell, you can actually encode the tuple as a pi type uh, by saying if you pass true to this function, you will get value of one type. If you get if you pass false to it, you get a value of another type. So a dependent function is a function such that you don't know uh, the result type of this function until you know what value it was applied to. Uh, and back to uh, this um, example with vectors, maybe you have a function replicate. And on lists, you have the replicate function, which takes an integer, then takes some value and gives you a list with this value repeated this n times. Uh, but if you've got the length of the list in the in the type, uh, you would say, okay, so replicate on vectors takes an int, uh, then it t uh, takes a value and it produces a vector of in uh, of a vector of values of length n. But what is n? N is the value that we passed in. So we don't. So we know uh, the general shape of the return type. We know it's a vector and we know the type of its elements, but we don't know its length uh, because the length uh, actually is referencing the runtime value um, and. Um, the reason it's called a dependent product is basically you can think about it uh, as a giant tuple where uh, so, so, so since we are dependent on an integer it means that the first component of a tuple is when we have run uh, replicate zero and we've got an empty vector there the, the second component is uh, a vector of one element, then the, the third component a vector of two elements, then three elements, four elements and uh, when you are like invoking this function, you're accessing the nth component of this infinite tuple, and that's like the mathematical uh, abstraction behi behind it. Of course, uh, at runtime there will be no tuples; there will be just functions. Uh, but that that like that's the intuition behind why it's called a product type, even though it's a function. Uh, similarly, a dependent sum uh, is actually a product in the in the usual sense because you have the first component and the second component but it's called the sum because it generalizes the normal sums uh, and it's like easy to get confused with it but only because of the terminology actually the the concepts themselves are not that confusing yeah uh, again thank you for explaining and i feel like i 
understand it even better. And having these, you know, analogies helps me wrap my head around them because again, I've heard of Sigma and Pi types before, but never really understood what they meant. And now I understand why they're not called, you know, dependent sums or dependent products because while they can model those things, maybe that's not the best way to think about them or that's not how they're actually implemented. Wait, wait, maybe I wasn't clear enough, but Sigma types are dependent sums and pi types are dependent products. So that's, those are synonymous. Right, but also you said that the sum types are implemented as tuples, right? And yes, the tuples yes. are implemented as functions. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so you, you've got like um, internally to represent a dependent sum, you actually have a pair and to represent a dependent uh, product, you actually have a function. So you've got like to to up the st to have the more expressive, like more general type to represent um, a less expressive type in order to add dependents to it. Right. So a little tricky, but I, I feel like I'm getting it. That reminds me of a, a maybe similar effort which other people may be familiar with of liquid Haskell. And I understand that that's refinement types, which are different than dependent types, but it seems to me like there's a significant amount of overlap there, but I do understand that they are different. Can you explain what the difference is between, you know, the current implementation of liquid Haskell and what may be in the future dependent Haskell? Yes. So liquid Haskell, uh, is also Refinement types are basically a limited form of dependent types. Why? Because you are referencing value level uh, variables in your types. You are saying that uh, when you're taking, uh, for example, you, you could assert using liquid Haskell that when you sort a list, this list is of the same length. So in the return type of your, uh, of your function, you can reference the length of the input type using refinement types. Uh, and this is in fact dependence, but um, unlike uh, like full blown dependent types where you've got sigma and um, pi types, um, you can only use annotations like this. Uh, and this uh, basically, means two things. First, uh, for the use cases that refinement, where refinement types are applicable, they've got better ergonomics. So whenever it's possible, I would rather use like refinement types over like uh, row dependent types uh, because it's this like the same thing we've discussed with uh, using your a, a user defined data type or encoding everything using primitives uh yeah, so dependent types that uh, are introduced as part of dependent haskell they're a more primitive notion while refinement types are Im imagined uh, as a more user like closer to what users will want to write but that also means that we will uh we'll be able to combine them and uh, eventually liquid Haskell can be built on top of dependent Haskell as an extension to it, uh, which basically adds SMT solving. So every proof in dependent Haskell, you would have to write by hand. And if you want to convince the compiler that, for example, addition commutes, you, you will have to like go through the f first um, argument of your addition uh, and structurally recurse over it and then prove associativity or commutativity or whatever property you care about uh, while with refinement types you're relying on SM an SMT solver to do all the proving for you uh, and that also means that with refinement types when it works it's nicer because you didn't have to write out the proofs but when it doesn't work you're stuck you, you either get this SMT solver to do it for you or like it's uh, a lost situation. Whereas with dependent types, you just think harder and write a more complex proof. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for explaining. It sounds like refinement types as implemented by Liquid Haskell are a limited subset of dependent types and they may play nicely together in the future. Yes, definitely. And uh, my, my only gripe with Liquid Haskell is that it's a separate tool, so it lags a little bit behind like the, the latest version of GHC. And if GHC shipped refinement types uh, in its standard distribution, 
I would be a huge proponent of this feature and I would be trying to use it like uh, in as much places as possible. As many, okay. pla as many places as possible, yes. Yeah. So I think uh, you mentioned earlier the website you created for getting GHC developers kind of onboarded and up and running. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, so basically we snatched the domain ghc.dev uh, and I tried to think of something uh, that would be fit for this domain um, and I decided that uh, it, it's got to be a page about GHC development and I've got like this huge grandiose idea about writing a blog post there with the news about GHC development and uh, maybe some uh, computed stats about contributions who is the top contributor, what they're working on and stuff like that. And the st and I would just start with the instructions, how somebody could, uh, um, somebody could get hacking uh, and participate in GTC development. But uh, as it happens, like that's where it's ended. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got this static page, uh, but I've also had a lot of people tell me that they find, found it extremely useful and it was like the only steps they could find online that worked for them to build GHC. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so basically it's a very small page that's got 10 or so sections and it says like for documentation go here, for downloading go here, for building go here, here are two commands to test your program, here are two commands to uh, run GHC in debug mode to figure out what's wrong with your uh, patch and so on. Uh, and I've made sure that every command on this page is copyable, so it's a cheat sheet that I use myself frequently, so um, <clears throat> GHC, uh, it's got this uh, an unfortunate, in my opinion, decision. Uh, it uses submodules, uh, and it makes Git really flaky. And uh, when I try to change branches, it sometimes just tells me no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my approach to development is to have a separate GHC copy, uh, GHC repository copy uh, for each of the features I'm working on, um, and I. Uh, that, that means I frequently need to build from scratch. So I think, oh, okay, I need to work on uh, yet another feature I'm building from scratch. Uh, and I go to this gc.dev and start copying stuff from there. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So not proud of that one, but uh, uh, it also means that uh, others get to copy paste as well, which I guess is great. <laughs> yeah, no, that is great. And I like that you use it yourself routinely because that means these commands are likely to continue to work moving into the future because I know one problem not just with Haskell documentation but pretty much any documentation is that they may have been accurate at the time they were written but things change and the fact that you continue to use it means that hopefully if one of those commands doesn't work for you you'll go and update it. Yeah definitely. Uh, and by the way, it's, um, I also wanted this page to be as small as possible. So, uh, I mean, in terms of download time, uh, and uh, I wrote it in Haskell. So it, uh, it attests to the existence of CSS and the HTML libraries for Haskell. So I didn't use some, so, so I, I started thinking about writing like raw HTML and CSS and using some sort of Webpack or whatever other GC tool is currently the the <clears throat> the favorite one in the G, uh, in the JS community, and I like couldn't get the result I wanted from any of them. They keep they kept inserting things that I didn't actually want in my end product, and I decided screw it. I'll write it with Haskell, and uh, that that was like the best decision. So <laughs> um, Haskell is. Um, Turns out it's like a good DSL, not only for like web services where you need to ge generate things dynamically, but also if you need a simple static page, Haskell also come, comes in handy. Yeah, I agree. The Haskell Weekly website itself is generated or served with Haskell. It used to be generated, now it's served. So yeah, if any of the listeners are interested in contributing to GHC, I would recommend going to ghc.dev and seeing Vlad's copy-pastable commands there to get started. So Vlad, we've covered a lot of ground here and we've talked a lot about dependent Haskell and 
your contributions via the proposal process and the committee and this website. Is there anything else that I haven't asked you about that you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess you have like a better sense of what the listeners of the podcast would be interested uh, in hearing. So uh, like I'm open to any questions, professional and personal. So fire away. Well, I think we've covered most of the things I've been taking notes through this whole thing. One thing you mentioned at the start of the episode that I wanted to get a little more clarity on was you mentioned um, actually simplifying things with dependent types, which was intriguing to me because dependent types themselves feel like a very advanced feature, but it does seem like you can use that advanced feature to make your implementation simpler or easier to understand or have fewer bugs. Could you expand on that? Um, yeah, so basically it wouldn't be a simplification of the current best practices for Haskell uh, because current best practices, in my opinion, is to avoid type level features because um, <laughs> uh, uh, it's a rabbit hole and as soon as you start using them, uh, you need more and more uh, because if you like stick to types where not many type parameters are involved, uh, sometimes you just throw runtime errors and like you continue development uh, and sometimes it shows up in tests and you have to debug it, but like that's life. Uh, even with dependent types, you will not prove every property of your program and you will have runtime failures. Um, and if you want to statically guarantee that everything about your program is correct, currently Haskell isn't the right language for that. But uh, there is like this gray area where you start, where you're trying to get as as far as possible with the features that GC currently provides. And you first start by enabling JDTs. And when you enable JDTs, you get these type indices. And, some, and sometimes to compute the type index of some return type, you need to do some computation on the type indices of the input type. And you start writing close type families. Um, to, in order to do that, because that's the current practice for uh, writing what would be a term level function, but on the type level. Uh, and once you get into type families, uh, you are writing in a language with no evaluation semantics. It's not a lazy and not a strict language. It's like whatever the type checker wants to do language. Uh, and it means that if you write a sort that in terms would have one asymptotic complexity, let's say, um, let's say it's a quadratic sort, maybe you're bad at algorithms, but, uh, uh, oh, but maybe you're not bad at algorithms. Maybe it's just that the, uh, the, the features of type families are so annoying to use that you just write <laughs> the minimum amount of code possible to get it to compile, um, because you don't even have like first class case analysis. Uh, you don't have lambdas, you don't have any of that. Uh, anyway, you write your sorting algorithm and you are thinking to yourself, well, maybe it's not the best algorithm, but it's got to work in a reasonable amount of time, but uh, it will not finish compiling an, until the end of universe because uh, in branches that should not be computed, it actually computes them all. And if you have like a condition if uh, and it evalu the, the condition evaluated to true, the type checker will decide to evaluate both branches, both both then and false. And as soon as you get something recursive, like it's hopeless. <laughs> I mean, it, it it might change the its asymptotics with the minor compiler version update. Uh, so type families, uh, a great tool in a very limited amount of use cases. And I would say the use cases where you are not defining recursive type families. So if you've if you just have like flat instances uh, associating one type to another without complex computation, then type families are like ready for prime time, use it in production. But uh, as soon as you start doing it, uh, it's very easy to slip uh, and start <laughs> writing just a little bit of recursive type families. And maybe like, it works in this limited amount of circumstances, but then you're, uh, for example, you're processing a small type level list. It, it used to have five elements, 
but now it has six and now it has 10 and with the bad asymptotics by the time it gets to 12 elements uh, like uh, we actually had this problem uh, that we needed 80 gigabytes of RAM to compile our project. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Um, and we could only use it, uh, we, we could only do it on our CI machine uh, and uh, locally we, uh, we had to put uh, some unsafe curses here and there just to get it to shut up. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so that wasn't a pleasant experience and uh, I'm hoping that all of that will like go away with the Ben and Haskell and uh, one of the things that we are planning is that um, you would be able to use term level functions at the type level and they will have uh, term level evaluation semantics. Uh, which means that you get lazy evaluation, you get reasonable asymptotic behavior. Uh, maybe we could even, on uh, on platforms that support dynamic linking, maybe we could like load the dynamic object and execute the actual term level function at native speeds. Uh, as long as you don't have any scolums in your input, and scolums are uh, basically unknown at the current uh, in, in the current part of program, it's an unknown variable. Um, and if you don't have any of those in your inputs, then we could do this dynamic linking thing. Um, so it wouldn't cover everything, but uh, it would be a possible speed up. And that's what uh, basically template Haskell does currently. Uh, because template Haskell, if you're using uh, some function, uh, of course, uh, it needs uh, to have some shared object, it loads it and then uh, every every uh, so for example make lenses if when you run it the generator for your lenses it it runs at uh, native speeds on your machine uh, and uh, we are basically looking uh, towards making this integration seamless so instead of writing like template Haskell splices and working on a meta level where you are producing uh, ASTs from values, so you get values as input, but you're producing ASTs. Uh, we are like removing this unnecessary abstraction barrier and we are producing values from values um, or types from types. Um, and the, the, the hope is that it will have the ergonomics of term level programming the performance of term level programming, but integrate integrated with the type checker. That all sounds really promising. And I can definitely empathize with some of the problems that you've expressed about type level programming. Just in the last episode, my coworker Cameron and I were talking about our tech stack. And one of the tools that we use is servant to implement our HTTP server. And I think servant is kind of a poster child for something that's doing something that's approaching dependent Haskell uh, using all of these kind of weird approaches, type families and stuff like that. And we've actually run into some of those problems where either it requires too many resources, whether that's CPU time or RAM or whatever, or it's accidentally quadratic in you know the number of routes we have or something like that. And they've been challenging to work around. So I can appreciate that a complicated effort like dependent Haskell could make that type of programming easier and more ergonomic in the future. So I look forward to that. Yes, so Servant is a great example. Uh, it's a library I absolutely love and I use it whenever possible. And as as long as I have not too many endpoints, it works beautifully. But like it, it starts to get slower when you get more endpoints. Uh, and there is nothing wrong with the library. It's just that GC doesn't have the facilities to um, implement this uh, wonderful type level approach in a more direct manner. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that with dependent apps, this will be a solved issue. Yeah, I hope so too. It would make our development life easier. Okay, well, that was the last thing that I wanted to loop back on. So I'll, I'll throw it back to you, Vlad. Anything else that you wanted to talk about? Uh, well, I'll, I'll guess I, I'll just abuse this platform to uh, yes, please. to say that I'm learning German. So if anyone wants to help me, please do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they can trade. They'll teach you German and you can teach them some GHC development. That's definitely a trade I would do. All right. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Vlad. It's been a pleasure. 
talking with you about dependent Haskell and everything else related to GHC development. I hope you had a good time. Uh, I definitely had, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, so um, I'll I'll do my best not to disappoint with dependent types. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I guess uh, bye everyone. Oh, before you go, actually, if people want to find you online, where should they look for you? Uh, so I open Twitter daily, uh, unfortunately, so you can find me there. <laughs> All right. And I think your handle is int index. We'll put a link to it in the show notes, but yeah, unfortunately I, I feel that with Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Um, find me there. All right. Well, thanks again, Vlad. Thanks for being on the show. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Haskell weekly podcast. I've been your host, Taylor Fossack. And with me today was special guest Vladislav Zvialov. If you want to find out more about the podcast, please visit our website, haskellweekly.news. This week, we're brought to you by our employer, IT Pro TV, an ACI learning company. They would like to offer you 30% off the lifetime of your subscription by using the promo code HaskellWeekly30 at checkout. Head over to itpro.tv to get started today and use promo code HaskellWeekly30 at checkout to get 30% off the lifetime of your subscription. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week.